and welcome to the Self-Empowering Trauma Healing Facilitators Workshop. Thank you for being here today and I want to say that I acknowledge each and every one of you for the courage it took for you to be here today. There are many other places that you could be and you've chosen to be here with Cynthia for the Trauma Healing Workshop. And I am Maria Sangria. Who I am for the world is unity, healing, and forgiveness. So I make sure that every sacred step of the way, whatever I do, is in alignment with unity, healing, and forgiveness. So I'd like to now introduce Cynthia Rose Young Slosher. For those of you who are familiar with biofeedback, the heart puts out an electrical field, an electromagnetic field, 5,000 times stronger than the brain. 5,000 times. Five times would be a lot. Twice would be a lot. But it's 5,000 times. And that is where our power is. When we stop loving, we really, in a way, have already died. When we stop loving in a way we have stopped living and the traumas that happen to us from conception on make us so afraid of opening our hearts and being hurt again that the heart begins to shut down and that's what this workshop is about is opening that heart again and the way to open the heart is to heal the wounds of the heart. The heart will heal itself just like your body will heal itself. In fact, we really have four bodies. We have a spiritual body, we have a mental body, we have an emotional body, and we have a physical body. As above, so below, they all have built-in healing capabilities. When you cut your physical body, you don't have to understand how it heals itself. It'll do it on its own. And when your heart is broken over and over and over again, you don't really have to understand how it does it. It will heal itself. So that's what we're going to talk about today. It's a self-empowering um, technique that my husband of 25 years developed at the VA Medical Center in Tuskegee, Alabama when he ran the post-traumatic stress disorder clinic there. He was there 17 years. He only ran the clinic six years because he spent the other 11 years seeing what is obvious to all of us is that we didn't know how to fix it. Conventional therapy could not touch it with a 10-foot pole. All they could do with the veterans returning with PTSD was to medicate them. And the suicide rate was so high that as many died at their own hands as died in the war. And nothing worked. So after 11 years of seeing that it didn't work and seeing these guys fall by the wayside and meeting their distraught wives and their damaged children, uh, Michael stormed the gates of heaven. He went into deep prayer and retreat and he absolutely demanded of God to show him how to heal these guys and their families and their children. And what happened was, is he collected a little bit here and a little bit there from the best therapist in the field. William R. Emerson, Arthur Janoff, the list goes on and on. It seems like everybody had a little bit of the pie, and when he got all the little pieces of the pie together, there were still a few pieces missing. And he was shown what to do. He finally put together a self-help buddy system. So he had to devise a system that he could train the guys who would come into the clinic to go out there to train their buddies. And it had to be a quick train. And he came up with this system, he trained the guys, and listen to this, he did follow-up assessments 
Every time the guys came into the clinic, they had to fill out this long form, and guess what? Months and months later, even years later, the flashbacks never returned. The nightmares never returned. And when he retired from the system, we applied this to the civilian population successfully. There was a major difference between the military personnel and the civilian population in that with the military personnel there are two selves that are at constant war with each other. They hate each other. One self is what we call the caring self. It's who the soldier was before they went into military programming. And the other self we call the combat self, which is the cold-blooded killer that came out of military uh, programming. The, the caring self, generally with these guys, they wouldn't hurt a fly. You know, they could love and care and be sensitive, and the combat self had to toughen up, couldn't afford to be sensitive. So we had to go through um, a preliminary program of integrating the combat self with the caring self. I talk about emotions being compressed information, much like a zip file. Emotions um, are, are, are so powerful. It's like Debbie said, they really run the show. Your adult self can you know, make all kinds of positive affirmations and have all kinds of good intentions. But if you have a very hurt inner child self, it's going to sabotage it. And that child needs attention. And the other thing that everybody wants and everything wants is to be accepted. And that is how you heal emotions in a nutshell. And all this other stuff is supporting that. If you want your emotions, like if you cut yourself, you know, you have to clean the wound out and just do a few common sense things. If you want your emotions to heal, it needs attention, number one, and it needs acceptance, number two. It will heal itself. Number one, even if you didn't care about your emotions, even if you could give a fig about all that, but you wanted to be smart, you wanted your brain to be genius level. You wanted clarity uh, in your neocortex. Until you heal your emotions, you ain't going to get there, folks. It's biologically impossible. And this shows why. Your brain has three basic areas that evolved over millions of years. You have what I call the primitive brain, which is the reptilian brainstem. That's your fight or flight thing. And then you have the limbic system, which is your emotions. And then you have the neocortex. And what happens is when the heart is wounded, when, when you are in your mother's womb, whether it's when you're born, whether it's when you're six years old, whether it's when you're in war, when you're 18 or 19 years old, any time in your life that you feel emotional wounding, the primitive brain registers danger and it contracts. And all Raphael Kushner's books are about checking your body and finding where there's a contraction, where there's tension. Wherever there's tension in your body, there are emotions gathering around it. And if you can become aware of these emotions, you don't have to analyze them, you don't have to defend them, you don't have to rationalize them. None of it, you just become aware of them. And you accept them. You don't feel guilty about it, you don't resist it, you don't act it out destructively. You simply go into your body, feel where it's tense, understand that it's tense because there's emotions there on a subconscious level and accept the emotions. That releases the contraction, which means the blood, fight or flight response, goes down. The blood can flow into the limbic system where you can feel the emotions. Again, you don't have to analyze them. You don't have to intellectualize them. You don't have to feel guilty about them or justify them. You just 
feel them. They will heal themselves. And it doesn't take long. For those of you who watch the DVD, that veteran had been suicidal for 20 years. And he just told uh, Dr. Schlosser, my husband at the time, he says, Doc, I can't take it anymore. I, I just can't take another day of it. So instead of killing himself, he was talked into coming into the clinic and do a clearing. And in a little over two hours, a 20-year-old issue was resolved permanently because he paid attention and he accepted. And the rest was automatic. So once the uh, emotions are felt through, then the blood flows into the neocortex where you can think clearly and creatively. Okay? So most people want to heal their emotions so they can feel good. But even those who don't, who just want to be geniuses, you're going to still have to do it. It's real simple. It's so simple that it's almost impossible to figure out why, because it's common sense. And common sense is a rare commodity. So anyway, um, this is the technology. It's a self-help technology. The thing about feelings is they are compressed information. If you can just accept them instead of analyzing them, instead of acting them out destructively, just accept them. Get in touch with them, feel the tension in your body, feel the feelings. Now some of you will actually feel them as feelings. Some of you might see pictures. Some of you might have sensations. Um, each of us is different, how we process this stuff. But you'll get, you'll get it. Just let it flow. Just let it run. There's two. There's two ways that you can work with your own emotions or work with anyone else's emotions. One is to either you or you tell them to find the tension in the body and then accept, the, accept them. I accept you feelings. Whatever feelings are there, it can be rage, it can be anger, it can be desperation, it can be hopelessness, it can be fear, it can be anything. And the knee-jerk reaction is to be ashamed of it for this little voice in your head to say, oh, well, you're not supposed to feel that. You're a new age light worker, and those are negative feelings, and blah, 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 blah. That is not accepting them. That's criticizing them. It's put downs. It's shut downs. The emotions will not heal if you do that. You know what? Your emotions are like a little child. The little child could be screaming over anything. It could be screaming because there's a monster in the closet. It could be screaming because a friend that day took the red truck and you had to have the blue truck and you wanted the red truck. It could be anything. A good parent just hears a little child screaming in there, goes in there, puts his arms around the child, pays attention, and accepts the feelings of the little child and just lets the little child cry. Doesn't make the child right or wrong, doesn't try to analyze it. Just lets the little child cry. And that little child will not be wounded through its whole life from that trauma because it processed it right there on the spot. So all of my and your inner wounding is just stuff like that that didn't get processed at the time that was suppressed. Now let me tell you what happens when we suppress our emotions. And this is a real kicker. But first I'm going to tell you the other quick fix. The other quick fix is something I learned from the shaman back in the 80s. It's called dreaming eye movement. And interestingly enough, in the psychotherapeutic field, they came up with the almost identical thing, calling it EMDR, or eye movement desensitization response. But basically, if you watch a, a mammal, be it animal or human, dream, you will see the eyes move back and forth. That's it. When you're in a feeling, if you will take your little finger here and just go like this, keep your head straight in front of you, and feel the feeling while you're doing this, it doesn't take long, maybe 20 of these things, and the feeling changes, just like it does in a dream. 
In fact, one of the people in the workshop this morning was so upset, had tears running down their face, and that's what I did. I said, look at my finger. I did this. I said, keep feeling the feeling now. Keep feeling the feeling. And I said, tell me when the feeling changes. And it was like, what, one minute? One minute? And they use this with the veterans. And, and psychotherapists get trained in it. And they get certified in it. And there are books on it. I have articles right here on it. But uh, it's something the shaman has been doing forever and a day for thousands of years. It's called dreaming eye movement. That's what they call it. It's described in some of the Carlos Castaneda books that came out during the 70s when Don Juan was teaching the apprentices. So if you're in a feeling or someone else is in a feeling and you gotta process it real quick, just stay in the feeling and do this. Okay, so those are your two quick fix things. Is the dreaming eye movement thing. And you don't even have to use your finger. You just do your eyes this way. You, know, you can pretend like you're reading a book. Nobody has to even know you're doing it. That's number two. And number one is become aware of where the tension is in your body. Put your attention there and accept the feelings. They will change quickly. Now, if it's something that's been held down for a very long time, say you're feeling tension in your gut, so you put your attention there and you, you ask yourself, well, what are the feelings making my gut all tight? And you get all this Oh my God, people are not approving of me. Oh, I'm not prepared. I'm going to fail. <gasps> and you just accept the feelings. It'll change pretty darn quick, but it may move to another area of the body. It might move up to your throat, in which case you put your attention there. And you pay attention to it and you accept it. And it'll change pretty quick. And again, now that's the quick fix stuff. And I can almost guarantee you it'll work every time. I'm going to tell you something pretty scary. Guess what? When you get physically hurt and or emotionally hurt, the brain secretes the exact same opiates into the bloodstream. The brain does not distinguish between emotional wounding and physical wounding. And this is a survival mechanism that has evolved over millions of years so that when you are either physically or emotionally hurt, you can function and get to safety. That is the primitive brain fight or flight response. Well, okay, well that's great. You know, so the emotional pain is numbed out and the physical pain is numbed out. What's wrong with that? Well, guess what? And this is the scary part. What numbs out the pain numbs out the joy. It's the same thing. When you're numbed out to your pain, you're numbed out to your joy. All these people who have been deeply emotionally wounded wonder why life is so bland, why pleasure is so hard to come by, and so fleeting if they can even feel it at all. And they go to ever more extreme lengths with chemicals and other things to feel anything. It's because the opiate level in their blood, which is holding down all the unresolved emotions from conception on, is deadening out their joy. They cannot get high on life. It is chemically impossible. So, if you want to get high on life, if you want to feel joy, if you want to be able to experience rapture at the simple things, the emotional pain has got to be healed. It takes tremendous energy to keep all that pain suppressed. It's exhausting. So when you get triggered, you know, a friend betrays you, uh, your cat dies, the boss disapproves of your work. You have a temporary spike of emotional distress that catches the body unawares and for a brief period of time you have access to the emotional pain. And if you'll read Raphael Kushner's work, 
or just take my word for it or put it into practice, you can use that as a doorway, a wormhole, a stargate to surf the painful feelings back in time to access the earlier wounded self because you can't heal emotions that you're not even aware of. It's a catch-22. You want to heal your emotions, but you're not aware of them. You can't be aware of them because your body's numbing them out. So how can you do it? The way you do it is when you are blessed enough, fortunate enough, to get really upset over something in day-to-day -day life. It is, it is the door to the gold mine. This is a paradigm shift of the highest proportions because the way we have been trained, when you get upset, oh no! I'm upset. I've got to go eat something. I've got to go take a pill. Let's go to a movie. Let's have sex. Let's watch a football game. Anything, anything, anything but feeling this way. Make it go away as quick as I can. It's horrible. So, what happens? The brain produces the opiates. You numb out. And sure, you don't feel bad anymore. But you can't feel your joy either. And here's another really scary thing. Not only can you not feel your joy, but just like morphine will shut down the organs of the body in the hospital, these opiates damage the immune system. It damages the immune system's ability to heal the body. And this is where your cancer comes in unresolved emotion, heart attacks. Oh my God, it goes on and on. We've got to heal our emotions. So here's a paradigm shift of the utmost importance. And this is going from, oh no, I don't feel good. Let me go get some Prozac. Dun, 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 dun. To, oh, I don't feel good. I can finally access my early pain. So let me see. I'll use my quick fix techniques. Woo! Woo! I'm going to find the tension in my body. Oh, it's right here. Ugh. God, I'm really scared. This is how I felt when I was a kid. I couldn't stand to go to school because I, I felt like people didn't like me. And I was embarrassed and I was shy and it's because my parents didn't affirm me and I didn't feel good enough. Oh my goodness, I'm just going to feel it. Oh my goodness, I'm just going to accept the feelings. I'm just going to accept the feelings. I'm just going to accept it. And I'm staying with the feelings. I'm feeling it all the way through. I'm feeling it. Oh, that poor little girl that I was, that scared little girl. Day after day at school, feeling inadequate and loved. Oh, my God, and so the adult self has all this compassion and love and understanding for the little girl that I was and still am. And what is that adult self doing? It's being a therapist. So when you read Creating Another Self, The Inner Therapist, um, it's very, very important. It goes into the different cells and what the inner therapist self does and why and how. It's called the comparison between the self-help quick fix and the complete trauma healing process with facilitator. And the question is this, if the quick fixes work, you know, why even bother with, with uh, going through a formal trial plan, which is what you saw in the DVD? What we found in the, in the VA Medical Center is this. There are three things that have to change in a therapy session for the healing to be permanent. A memory is made up of visual images. 
which we call the still photo, or photo for short. It's made up of emotions, and all the primal therapy addresses the emotions. It'll, it'll relieve the pain of the emotions. And then the third thing is thoughts. It's beliefs about reality. So if you're going to, like with the combat vets, if you're going to permanently heal a horrible, horrible war trauma, the pictures, you know, of your buddies being tortured in front of your face or whatever it is, the emotions and the thoughts about reality, all three have to change. And that is what's called a complete trauma healing session, which should take a couple, three hours. And the way to do that is in your uh, workbook. The exact form that Michael used in the VA is in your workbook, and every single step is explained there so that you can not even know what you're doing, and you can do a trauma clearing facilitation with somebody anybody okay you just the, the important thing to understand is that healing has to come from within whether it's your physical body emotional body mental body or spiritual body the person has to do the healing within themselves and all you're doing is facilitating that any doctor can tell you that you know they'll clean the wound out and create the whole situation but the body itself does the healing, that the healing has to come from within. So all of this facilitating stuff is to help the person heal themselves. And so if you follow the, the trauma clearing form, you're simply asking the, the traumatized person a series of questions. And that's what was on the DVD was uh, these guys had gone through the combat integration of the caring and combat self prior. They had had to go through that kind of training first. But then they were trained how to facilitate and every time they came in, whoever was triggered would do a trauma clearing and then whoever wasn't as triggered, they would get in dyads. One would facilitate and one would do a clearing. The trauma clearing process helps you change what Michael called the PET, the picture, the emotions, and the thoughts. For example, um, say the emotions are, you know, rage, betrayal, hopelessness, um, stuff like that. And the trauma clearing form addresses every one of those in a certain order, okay? So what we've got to do is empower everybody with this technology and get it out there in the field. And if we can do it through technology over the web, we're going to do it. You never know when you're going to be faced with someone who has gone through military programming or who is in a fam family where a family member has gone through military programming and you're going to have to deal with it because you may find yourself in a situation where you're it. And so this right here is stuff that you can pull on in any emergency where you're dealing with people who are faced with this split between the combat and caring self. Um, it's good to self-empower yourself, to self-empower yourself. In other words, the inner self can say, oh, well, you know, I'm not a therapist and I live in my own little world and I'll never have to deal with this. Well, you might. You might. And it's good to be prepared. And you'll notice that just below the first paragraph, it, there's a note and it says, when working, on, when working with military personnel, it may be necessary to integrate the caring self, which is the pre-military uh, programming self with the combat self. This may be necessary before feelings are accessible for healing. If the traumatized person has a difficult time accessing emotions, please refer to handouts addressing this. Because you can clear somebody. Um, you know, you may just be bopping along, living your normal little everyday self, and then all of a sudden somebody goes ballistic on you. And you can pull this thing out and you can guide them through in a few hours to complete resolution that's permanent because on the form is an explanation of every step.
okay? <clears throat> Which is wonderful because, you know, as many times as I have helped facilitate a trauma healing, which is countless. Um, when I'm faced with someone who's about this far from killing themselves, the energy is so electric. And or it may happen at a time when I'm drained and I can't think clearly and I just got to show up for it anyway. With this trauma healing form, I don't have to think and I don't have to remember. And no matter how electric the energy is, I can just say, okay, we're going to do one, then they do one. Then I read it and I do two and they do that, and three, it's just, you know, it's happened yeah. every single time I've ever done it, and the interns at the clinic said they noticed it too. Um, as the person you're facilitating is going through the trauma and healing it, for some reason, as a facilitator, it will awaken similar stuff in you. And as they heal theirs, you heal yours. So it's really cool. It's really, really cool. Um, you know, while they're crying, I'm crying. But I'm crying over my own stuff that's similar to what they're going through a lot of times. And as they heal, heal theirs, I feel mine healing. So you're not only helping somebody, but you're helping yourself. Is a list. On the left side is a list of the combat self characteristics. And on the right is a list of the caring person characteristics. So I'm just going to read these. The combat side values survival. The caring person side values feeling good and wants to help. The combat side is closed-minded and very rigid. The caring person side is afraid of the combat side. The combat side knows it all. The caring person is, is tired of fighting and is in misery. The combat side won't listen. The caring person's side wants peace of mind and is willing to talk. The combat side is deaf and won't hear feedback. The caring person's side is seeking help. The combat side admits no fault and is a tyrant. The caring person's side admits mistakes. The combat side is no negotiating, uncompromising. The caring person's side is hopeful, warm and gentle and concerned about people, is sociable, open and caring. The combat side is all or none, no gray, it's black or white. They would always say you're with me or against me. There was no middle line. Uh, take no prisoners, no mercy, go all the way, the meanest SOB in the valley, angry, smoke them or get out of dodge, man of action, chip on the shoulder, tough, macho, pumped up, impulsive, impatient, aggressive, vindictive, frontier justice, violent. The caring person shows and admits feelings, needs and wants love, is optimistic and happy-go-lucky and believes things can change. The combat side allows anger but, with, uh, but considers all other feelings as wimpy. The combat side has this hidden fear and is intolerant of weakness. It has a fear of weakness is numb and not self-aware and hopeless, is deadened emotionally, it don't matter or it don't mean nothing. The caring side believes things can change, is able to trust, is a good father and husband, can appreciate positive qualities, has faith in God and man, can listen, appreciates, enjoys things, is full of gratitude, sharing and caring, and the bottom line is healing, whereas the combat side is deadened emotionally, is withdrawn, a loner, misunderstood, alienated, stays by the self, standoffish, guarded, sour attitude, Murphy's Law, if anything can go bad it will, pessimistic, expect the worst, overact to mistakes, life or death, lives in emergency all the time, alert, watchful and distrustful, suspicious, paranoid and persecuted, 
looking for danger, obsessive and won't let go. Dealing with, this is living inside one person. You've got the caring person self in there and you've got the combat side in there and they are at constant war with each other. And we found that before you could get them to do a trauma healing of their war traumas and heal their PTSD that you had to make peace between the two sides. Explanation of split work. Split work is the process of recognizing your combat side, getting to know your caring side, and then combine both sides into one whole healthy person. The combat side. This is the side that gets pumped up, shoots first, and asks questions later. It came into existence in Vietnam to help you survive, or the Gulf War, or Iraq, wherever it is. It's cold and uncaring, tends to be macho, non-compromising, believe in actions, not talking or feeling. And some guys, this combat side is an angry, rebellious loner, very hard to relate to, more like a juvenile delinquent than an adult. The caring side. Usually the person you were before the war still lives on as the caring person, but may be buried so deep that you're unaware that he still exists. This side is warm and caring about yourself and others. Before combat, it was very open. In many cases, he was happy-go-lucky or adventurous for enjoyment's sake. The health-seeking side is sorry and ashamed when wrong is done, worries about losing control, longs for intimacy and control, and longs to be normal. How the two sides interact before split work. In most combat veterans, the combat side and the caring side are opposites, like two totally different people living in the same body with completely different attitudes, behaviors, feelings, and lifestyles, giving rise to the observation by many combat wives, Lord, he's like two separate people, and I never know who I will be dealing with. The two sides usually do not see eye to eye on much of anything because the two sides are so totally different, do not approve of each other, and even try to get rid of the other, we talk about having a huge wall between them. The idea of a wall suggests the walling off or blocking off awareness from each other. So when one side is in control, the other tends to go completely out of awareness. What often happens in combat vets is not only do they continue to fight the war with everyone in their lives, turning some people into the enemy or bad guys, but there is a battle internally as well between the combat and caring side, fighting to stay in control and to suppress or kill off the other side. For example, the combat side may judge the caring person as a wimp, as weak, as useless, as worthless, and view the expression of caring feelings with disgust contempt or unrealistic outrage. Since he is a man of action to the combat side, often the only acceptable emotion is anger. Violence is his idea of the best solution to most every problem, either that or leaving the situation, just as in combat. The caring person typically lives in fear of the dangerous explosiveness of the combat side and what he is capable of doing. He hopes that if he can ignore him long enough, the combat side will go away. The caring person knows more about adjusting and living happily in peacetime, but the combat side is quite often a know-it-all, authoritarian son of a bitch. He won't listen to anyone or anything because he is stuck in absolute belief that all there is to life is a constant, never-ending life and death battle for survival. To the combat side, anyone and everything must be seen as a potential threat. So the combat side keeps one eye open, always on the lookout for emergencies, which he expects to happen at any time. And remember what we talked about this morning, about the primitive brain, the limbic system, and the neocortex. This all plays into that. So the purpose of split work is to reintroduce and reintegrate both sides into one whole healthy person. Also, to help you recognize the strengths of both sides and to increase caring traits and to decrease destructive and self-defeating combat traits. That's creating a balance. And then he goes into naming the sides. Now, this is very similar to working with multiple personality disorder. Um, 
syndrome or multiple identity disorder. That's what they're calling it now. Yeah. I think different D dissociative. Yeah, yeah, dissociative. Um, the thing to understand about that is that all of the different cells, whether it's these two or whether it's 16, you know, faces of Eve, um, the one thing they have in common is the survival of the survival of the body. They're, they're seeking for the entity to survive. And they come into existence at different times in a person's life. When, say, a little girl has a nice, happy family until she's three years old, in which case, say her father dies. Her mother has to go to work and she starts dating this guy who turns into an abuser. And the guy beats up and uh, abuses the mother and even abuses the child. Well, the original self that was in place till three years old can't handle that. So what happens is, is that a new personality emerges that is tough and has the uh, qualities that can survive the abuse, both of the mother and self. Okay? So say after, you know, six months, a year, two years, whenever, that guy goes away. And the child enters a whole new situation where personality number two is no longer needed. But it's still not the same situation she had with personality number one. She will create another self to deal with the new situation. And on and on and on and on. The one thing they have in common is the overall survival of the self. But you normally will get a lot of different personalities once the personality starts to split off. It will split and split and split and split. And some of the personalities will know about the other personalities and some won't. And so they will fight for control. I mean, let me just show you how powerful emotions are on the blood chemistry. And this is in Dr. Arthur Janov's book, The New Primal Scream, which is something I strongly recommend you get. They took a multiple personality disorder patient and took a blood test every time the patient went into another personality. Well, in the morning, when the guy was in one personality, they took a blood test and it was a healthy person, perfectly normal blood. Later that afternoon, he flips into another self, they take a blood test, advanced stage two diabetes. Mm -hmm in just a few hours. In just a few hours. When he flipped into another one and took a blood test, it was something completely different. <coughs> so our emotions has everything to do with our longevity and our health. And this applies whether the emotions are conscious or unconscious. And like we said in the earlier session, if you, if you can't feel your feelings, it's because you're numbed out, you're drugged by your own body so that you can survive and function. The pineal gland, which is a little pine cone shaped gland right in the middle of your brain, it's called the eye of Buddha by the ancient, uh, in the ancient writings, has over 20,000, that's a lot folks, 20,000 psychoactive chemicals in it that are a thousand times stronger than anything you can buy off the street or from a pharmaceutical company. So when our dear friend who flipped from one personality to another from normal blood to advanced stage two diabetes within a few hours. Imagine the power of the chemicals being secreted by the endocrine system into the bloodstream. So when you heal an old emotion, you are stimulating your immune system. When you go from negative beliefs about reality to positive beliefs about reality, you're signaling to your body, I want to live. 
because the negative beliefs say life is not worth living. The negative belief says, you know, you can't trust anybody. You know, life stinks. Well, the body is hearing, well, okay, you don't want to live. We can do that. We can shut down. You know, we can get cancer or we can arrange a car accident or a heart attack. But you heal those emotions to where life is good again, where your belief system is saying life is beautiful. You know, I'm being divinely protected. That was the one that we ran into with the veterans. When you look at your form tonight, they would list their emotions. We would find the memory that needed to be cleared. They would list their negative beliefs about reality that came from going through that traumatic experiences. And then they would list the positive beliefs about reality that they got from going through the experience. The normal reaction we got when we said, well, what positive beliefs about reality did you get from going through this horrible war trauma? They'd say, are you kidding? There's nothing positive about it. Well, Michael wouldn't let him off the hook. He'd say, nope. You go in there and you find a positive belief. So they would go deep within. They'd stir off in this space for a while. And they'd come out and they'd say, well, I survived. Y'all, that is a hugely positive belief. I survived. When people were dying all around me, I survived. That's as positive as it gets. And another common belief we ran into, there was a higher power protecting me. Because there's no logical reason on God's green earth that I survived and my buddies didn't. There's a higher power protecting me? Is that a positive belief? You bet. That's a real positive belief. And we would generally come up with four or five very positive beliefs. We went from, there's nothing at all positive about this, you must be crazy, Doc, to, I survived, a higher power was protecting me, and so forth. You see where that's going? Already the beliefs are beginning to change even before going into the emotions. And when you have these positive beliefs, it is like a command to your whole body, to your whole immune system. Well, do I want to live or do I want to die? Is life worth living or not? And earlier when I was speaking about our suicide problem, which we had in spades, The amazing thing about suicide is all you're killing is the body. You're not killing the emotions. The emotions go with you. So even if they kill themselves, they're still stuck with the same stuff that they were stuck with that made them want to kill themselves in the first place. Plus they have less resources to deal with it. Because at least down here, when your emotions are bad, there is technology. You, may, you know, a lot of guys never see it, but it does exist to heal all that. But if you die and carry it to the other side, you know, good luck. So, you know, suicide is really not an option. And there's, there's overt suicide where you do it on purpose, and there's passive suicide where you just keep doing things that are bad for you. And you know it's killing you, but you can't stop. It's a passive suicide. And if you succeed in doing yourself in, you're still going to have to deal with everything on the emotional plane. So it's really not a solution. Let's go to the double bind in combat. A lot of our combat veterans, and you'll find this with the, the present day combat veterans, um, really don't feel like they have a right to live. They have done such atrocities that they feel that it's unforgivable. And that's what this paper addresses. It's called the double bind in combat. Um, here it says it's a no-win situation. Damned if you do and damned if you don't. It's called a double bind. It's a forced choice between only bad options where there is no good thing to do. There's no way out except to do something you don't feel good about. You have to kill or be killed, basically. You don't want to be killed and you don't want to kill, but you have to. 
Either way you lose, you end up feeling lousy about what you did, like you blew it, like it was you who was wrong or bad rather than the situation itself. And the core wound in trauma clearing is often a double bind. And this is true even in the civilian population. So this is a very important handout to read. Um, what the guys would realize is that they had no choice. In other words, they weren't bad. They were just a person in a situation where there was no good choice. And they had to do something, and no matter what they did, it wasn't going to work. And it would be a huge aha for them in the clearing process. Now, Trish is just bringing up, well, how do you uh, integrate the two sides? Well, the way you integrate the two sides is basically the way you would integrate even if you had more than two sides. Because so almost everybody, in my opinion, and in the opinion of the people that I met who were some of the top people in the field, everybody has multiple personalities, and Debbie would agree. Some more extreme than others. But what we did with the combat vest is something called the empty chair work. And the empty chair work came, uh, is also known as Gestalt therapy. It's a whole system of therapy in and of itself. And like I said before, Michael would pick therapy from different uh, modalities. modalities and mix them all together. And basically we'd have two chairs facing each other and if you'll go back to um, the, uh, the part I didn't read to you about um, the explanation of split work, it says naming the sides. The name you choose for your combat side, combat side should describe your combat side as it really was in combat. The name should capture the main qualities that make him or her who she was in your mind. Some distinctive possibilities include your nickname in Vietnam or Iraq or the way you now think of that side of you. And then the caring self is usually the person's own name. Our other options include names that evoke a mental picture of your calm, caring side. And so uh, one side, say, uh, Coyote was a very uh, amazing veteran. Coyote would sit over here, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to use his real name, just call him Joe, would sit over here. Joe would be the caring side, and Coyote would be the combat side. And what we would have the two, what the combat would do is we'd have him first be the combat self. He'd be Coyote. He'd sit here, and he would imagine Joe sitting over here in the other chair, and he would talk to Joe. And he would say, you wimp. You make me sick. You don't know nothing about life. You go around wanting to feel good and all this, and, you know, just blah, 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 blah. Put down, put down, put down, put down. You know, life is hell. Don't you know anything? Blah, 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 blah. And Joe, you know, was an imaginary self. The body would be sitting here being coyote, talking to Joe, the imaginary self, and just get it all out. And then the body would move to this chair, become Joe, and Joe would talk back to the combat self and say, look, Coyote, you're killing yourself with this. You're beating up your wife. You're drugging yourself to death. You can't keep a job. You can't even love your kids. Life isn't even worth living being like this. I mean, don't you want to feel good? Don't you want to enjoy life? Don't you want to be a good father? So, Coyote's over here listening, going, well, you know, you've got a point. <laughs> and Joe would, you know, unload everything he had to say, and then the body would come back over here and be Coyote and talk back, and we would just have them go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until they could agree to disagree where Coyote would say, okay, Joe, you've got a point. You know, my life is hell. I am a lousy father. I almost killed my kid the other day. I can't keep a job. 
I'm taking so many drugs, you know, I can't keep going on this way and then I can't support my family. You're right, I need to tone this down and I need to take in some of your qualities. And Joe over here would say to the combat self, he'd say, but you know what, you've got good qualities too. You're brave, you're strong, you get her done, you can confront any obstacle. Um, you know, I admire you too. And what would happen is that Joe would take on the good qualities of Coyote and Coyote would take on the good qualities of Joe and they would literally merge. And this is what happens in multiple personality disorder as well. Only you'll have more than two chairs. You may have 16. <laughs> but they, you know, I remember there was this one uh, lady, she had multiple personalities and, and one she was gay and she was tough. You know, I mean, she was like out for bear. She was looking out after the other ones. And then there was this sweet little three-year-old self that was just as sweet and loving and trusting and naive as could be. And at the end of all the therapy, you get this sweetness and this loving and this innocence in a very strong person who can't be run over by a bulldozer and has integrated all these other wonderful qualities. I want to explain to you something that the combat vets told us that civilians generally do not understand. It's embarrassing. It's hard for our little ears to hear it. But the combat vets, and this is an understatement, love to kill. They love it. They call it going kill crazy. It is a bigger high for them than cocaine or anything could possibly be. And when we were studying with a shaman, uh, the first cousin of Carlos Castaneda, who wrote the Don Juan books that were popular back in the 70s, he said, and he was a, he was a Vietnam veteran too, he, he was the only one to come back alive out of his platoon 12 different times. And he did it as he'd been trained as a shaman and he used those powers. But he said that when a person dies, that their great light assemblage point explodes. In other words, their soul, which is infinite, powerful, omniscient, divine being, is located right here about where the belly button is. It's about three fingers down and in a few inches. And it's, it's, when it comes into a body, it's very, very tiny. And it's, it's like a, if you study nuclear physics, uh, when you explode an atom of plutonium, it's, it's uh, very powerful. You know, you get the nuclear bomb out of it. You get a chain reaction. Um, the great light assemblage point, when it explodes out of the body, if you're in the vicinity of it, you get showered with this explosive energy. And it is a high. Any of you who've done hospice work or has been around someone who's died, you even get it to some extent when an animal dies. But it's a high that can't be beat. Now, and so this handout here at 7X is the exhilaration of killing as a normal response to combat. At the top is the multiple attitude causes of good feelings, and at the bottom is the shamanistic perspective. Michael put both of them there, and I'll just read it. The most intense adrenaline high at 18-year-old at peak vitality from killing. Feeling of accomplishment of a job well done, the ultimate win. I mean, this is what military programming is all about. That problem is solved, the enemy is dead. Complete release of anger to its final resolution suddenly. Sense of unspeakably great relief, knowing I made it, the threat is ended, because it's kill or, kill, kill or be killed. Heightened valuing of life, gratitude for being spared suffering or maiming. Total concentration is an altered state of consciousness. Empowerment of control over life and death, it's a godlike feeling. Total self-responsibility, saving your own life. You get accolades, medals, pride about saving peers, admiration by closest friends. Extreme fear of losing your life to extreme triumph. Bad feelings rocket to good instantly. Acuity of feeling alive in the present instant, maximized by seeing others die and expecting it yourself any time, but free of threat for this moment. 
Kill or be killed ambivalence is replaced by charged focus clarity. Prowess in a game, excelling at training like a sport. The game of wits, excitement of a hunter at the same time being hunted by its prey of equal intelligence, outsmarting the foe, meet beat the challenge. The feeling of intimacy, bonding with buddies who share the same unspeakably intense experience, and then below that the shamanistic perspective on the high of killing. I wish he had done more on this. I wanted to show you this beautiful, this is an original teaching poster done by Dr. Schloss. Um, it's called The Deeper Level Where's the Juice. You see, when you're talking with somebody, you can talk about what you've done or what they have done. You can talk about your thoughts. You can talk about what's in your gut, which would be style four. And you can talk about intent, what you intend to do. And in a close, intimate relationship, whether it's between two lovers or a business partner that you have to be with all the time, uh, through the good days and the bad, through, you know, all the stuff that you have to go through, if you can if you can talk about, I saw you do this, or I'm sensing that you're sad, or you can talk about what's on your mind. You know, I have these wonderful ideas about how we can increase our bottom line, all we got to do, or what's in the gut. You know what? I don't feel good about that uh, new customer. It, he scares me to death. I don't trust him. I think we need to do a background a check on him. You know, the gut, I, I'm feeling bad in my gut. And then intent. You know what, I think we need to use maximum efficiency, minimum effort. I think we're, we need to work smarter, not harder. You know, my intention is that this time next week, I'm gonna come up with five different ways we can get more done on less time. And then acts is obvious, you know, it's like, um, you know, I saw you do this, or I'm going to do that. Well, I'm going to do that would be an intent. But acts, let's see what he says for acts. Would be interpersonal juicy actions. Um, I interrupted you. I quit. I'm leaving. I'm pausing. Confessions. I lied. I did it. Copying. I was late. I dropped off the clothes. I dropped my clothes on the floor. ID triggers. I lose it when I'm reacting to you like my mom. Those are acts. Those are acts. So with the five senses, you even have the sixth sense, which would be my inner guidance. I notice with the, with the mind, you have breakthroughs and insights like I just realized it hit me that I'm open to reprogramming ID patterns. I saw it again, meta communication. With your gut, you, you're surfing and melting and risking from the wounded child or the free child. And with intent, you're creating the future. <clears throat> you're setting limits. I won't. I'm not willing. You're asserting uh, commitments. You know, I will clear. I'll take responsibility. You're initiating change. I wish you would. I choose to, and so forth. So um, just keep this in mind when you are creating intimacy. Microphone. Oh, thank you. Just keep this, these uh, five ways of communicating in mind when you're creating intimacy with a partner. Don't get caught up in style one topical stuff all the time, even if it's good natured. Because just that's not real. You can't have a relationship like that. Um, it's okay to joke and be style one a lot of the time. And it's okay to sometimes bark commands like, quick, get in here, it's raining. I don't want that to get wet. But a relationship needs the, the vulnerability and going into the child level. And before I get into responsibility of the soul, I wanted to comment on that. And that is we've got four brainwave patterns. The human brain has four brainwave patterns. And the uh, superficial one is called beta brainwave pattern. It's your five senses, your memory, your logic. It's about 12 to 14 oscillations per second and up. And it becomes dominant uh, right about at puberty. And the next brainwave pattern is called the alpha brainwave, and that's where your feelings are. And feelings are where the power is. And then you've got theta brainwave patterns, which is your deep inner thoughts. It's where you imagine and you create the future, visual images, for good or for ill. Like if you're scared and you're triggered, you might be imagining that somebody's stalking you down a dark street. 
You're creating that in your mind. Or if you're in a good place, you might be creating having a beautiful concert next week. You could just see yourself being in ecstasy up there on the stage and everybody just flowing with it. But you're creating in, in theta brainwave. And then the fourth one is the delta brainwave, which is pure being. And for those of you who study alchemy, or study shamanism, or study any of the um, more esoteric sciences, which they've definitely gotten into the military a long, long time ago, remote viewing and things like that, if you're studying any of those things, you get into the four brainwave patterns. And you learn about them because you have to enter in those, into those deeper levels to operate on the more um, astounding levels of cognition. And as I was saying earlier, because I'm going to wrap back up to what I started out with, you can't really get into theta without going through alpha. Alpha is your feelings. If your feelings are wounded, you're stuck in fight or flight. Your primitive brain is getting all the blood. Uh, your neocortex can't get it. The limbic system can't get it until you clear. And so once you clear and you have these high positive feelings where you're at peace and you're not in fight or flight, you can get into the thought, you can get into the neocortex. And you have clarity and you have creativity there. You can become as psychic as you want to be. And then from there, if you're on a spiritual path, you use your psychism to attune to the divine in yourself and in creation and you'll enter into the delta brainwave, which is um, a state of pure being and unity with divine mind and all creation. That's where Christ went to when he said, I and the Father are one. When the disciples, for, for those of us who are Christians here, when the disciples went up to Christ, they said, well, are we going to be able to heal the sick and raise the dead and do all the things that you did? And he said, I of myself can do nothing. That's the beta brainwave. I and myself can do nothing. And he says, it's the Father within, it's he that doeth the works. That's the Delta brainwave. And so he said, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all else shall be added unto you, and the kingdom of heaven is found within. So he's saying, go within, go within, go into your feelings. And the, uh, one of the interpretations of the whole crucifixion is, is that when you get crucified by life in the outer world, and you have to go within to deal with it. You go to hell first. He went to hell for three days before the resurrection. And he says, all that I do, you shall do and more. <laughs> so when we get crucified by events in the outer world, when our heart closes down, when our life force can't flow within us anymore, when our soul is basically almost dead, we're crucified on the cross of materiality and we die. We, we die to the outer world. We shut down the beta brain wave. We go into the alpha, into our feelings, and we go to hell. We go into the hell of our fear, of our woundedness, of our hopelessness, of our confusion, of our anger, our rage, and feelings that don't even have words. And we go through them. We don't go around them. We go through them. We let ourselves feel them. We pay attention to those feelings. That's what this whole seminar is about. And we let them flow and they heal themselves. And tonight is the most exciting part of this seminar when we go into the actual trauma clearing form because one of the things Michael called it and one of the things the combat veterans called it was from hell to heaven in one session. Because as bad as you feel, that's how good you're going to feel. It's like a pendulum. As far back as you pull it over here, it's going to go that far over here. The worse you feel when you clear, when you get that thing cleared, when you've changed the picture, the emotion, and the thought, the better you're going to feel. If you're just a little bit triggered, you'll just be a little bit high. If you're way, way triggered, you're going to be way, way high. And that leads to the healing bubble, which is, is the last thing we're going to learn today. The healing bubble uh, being that after you do a clearing, you have to 
be in a zone of silence for a few days because the psyche is completely reorganizing. The blood chemistry is totally changing in your body and it takes a few days for that to integrate. And during that time you're very vulnerable. It's like scar tissue. You have to let it firm up. So, um, I'm just saying, you know, learning about emotions is great and maybe you're here because you're working with your own or you're trying to help others, but I'm just telling you, it's not just great, it's a necessity. Our human organisms cannot function properly when we're walking around with a lot of emotional pain, especially when it's subconscious. Because we are opiated like a heroin addict, but with something a thousand times stronger than heroin. Chemicals from our own pineal gland that are survival oriented to numb us out so we can function till we get to safety. So isn't it about time we got to safety and go from the primitive brain, you go from the primitive brain, the way you get out is through the limbic system, which is the emotions, into the neocortex, where what happens? We discover our divinity and we begin to get enlightened. This is responsibility, the soul and transference by uh, Dr. Schlosser, 1997. The prevailing notion of being responsible in our society, unbeknownst to most of us who are over-responsible, has a very limited connotation to physical, material, financial, financial issues born of so-called conventional wisdom from our grandparents' post-depression mentality, or what could be termed middle-range thinking in this context Talking about being responsible is taken on a puritanical tone of martyrdom, of going without in order to meet one's financial obligations, etc. In short, it is a consciousness focused, to, focused on and limited to one uninspiring level of reality. What has been omitted is a much larger sense of responsibility to oneself that might be termed responsibility to the soul. In this larger context of responsibility, which very few people attune to, a broader spectrum of thinking, including possibility thinking, and being, including feeling good and being true to the spiritual purpose of one's incarnation, become included in our broader meaning of being responsible. Watch what you say to yourself when you're doing this. Listen to yourself talk. If you open this up and you say, I can't do this or it's too complicated, or this doesn't make sense, or I've never been good with this sort of thing, I'll never understand it, well guess what, so be it. You have just doomed yourself to whatever it was you just told yourself. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's called the inner critic, and there's a nice full page end out in there on just that. When my feelings get wounded, which they do because I feel everything deeply, I can fix them in 30 minutes or 3 minutes. I don't have to carry it around all the time and start taking drugs. You know, I'm, I'm not living in fear of my feelings and I'm not really all that afraid of being around negative people or negative situations. Like what's going on in the world is hard for all of us. The more dirt that comes out, the more we're just saying, you know, this is such a bummer. Well, I get bummed out like everybody else too, but I know how to heal the feelings. And what it's done for me is it's opened my heart to such compassion. When I see somebody acting out in a bad way, I know they're in a lot of pain. I've been there and I have compassion for them. There was a, instead of calling them a you know what, and judging them, oh, that's a bad person. Oh man, they're really messed up. You know, I my heart opens with infinite compassion for that person. And there was a very expensive uh, research done on the different ki kinds of psychotherapy as to which was effective and which was not. And they looked at a thousand different kinds, a thousand different kinds. And you know what they found? As long as there was one person <coughs> in the vicinity of the patient. It could be the secretary. It could have been the janitor. It could have been somebody's mother waiting out in the waiting room. But as long as there was one human being in the vicinity of the patient who had empathy for the patient. Empathy. Compassion. 
the therapy would, would be very successful. No matter which one it was. And no matter which one it was, if there was no one present there in a state of empathy, it would not be successful. Now, what is empathy but acceptance? You know, if y'all are being saintly and wonderful and beautiful and you're giving to the poor and you're doing all the things, that's easy to accept you. It's easy to accept you. Why wouldn't I? But if you're really SOB, you know, if you're really being bad, you're being bad to yourself, you're being destructive to your kids, you're horrible to be around, then for me to have empathy with you, to understand the incredible amount of pain you must be in to be acting that way, because nobody does that on purpose. Nobody wants to be a, a, a you-know-what on purpose. Everybody wants to be liked. Everybody wants to be likable. So if someone's acting badly in any way, shape, or form, they must be in a lot of pain. It's a red flag. It's a cry for help. And if you can honestly react, not in judgment and criticism, but with empathy, even if it's just somebody in road rage in a car next to yours that your whole contact with is three minutes and there's no personal contact, that person will go through a healing just having been in the aura or the telepathic contact someone who's aware number one and number two accepting when the awareness and the acceptance even comes from someone else it works everything the little kid says mommy mommy look at me be aware of me and then the little kid tries to act nice and good and make her mommy proud, but then when the little kid hurts her foot or the bee stings, and the mommy still accepts her, the healing takes place physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually automatically.
This is one of your handouts, by the way, comparing this kind of trauma healing with traditional psychotherapy. In this kind of trauma healing, you teach the patient how to do the therapy. And in conventional therapy, you don't teach them. In this therapy, you have a one to three hour session to complete permanent resolution. In conventional therapy, you have usually one hour at the most and no or little resolution, just part resolution at best. In this kind of psychotherapy, the, we have clear steps in a structured format, frequent SUDS ratings to guide the process, and rules govern exception, rules to govern exceptions. SUDS is an acronym for Subjective Units of Distress Scale. Subjective Units of Distress Scale. It is a scale from 0 to 10 where zero is no distress and 10 is off the scale, you're about ready to jump off a bridge. And if one of you was triggered, I could say, where's your suds? And you would go within and you'd say, it's at a seven. And if, if you said it was at a seven, if I could, I'd sit you down, we'd do a clearing right then. Because when you're at about a six or above, you can clear. Anyway. With this kind of therapy, the client is both the patient and the facilitator. The client is both the patient and the therapist, depending on the suds being high or low, respectively. In other words, in the clinic, in the VA clinic, uh, the combat vets would get in pairs, or dyads as Michael called them, and the more triggered vet would do the clearing, and the less triggered vet would be the facilitator. That's what he's talking about here. In conventional therapy, the psychologist is the therapist and the client is only the patient. In this therapy, you have a systematic idea of exactly which trauma to clear. There's only one thing you clear. But in traditional therapy, it is much less systematic, often shotgun venting. No sure way to know which trauma to work on. In this one, the trauma is permanently resolved in one session. In conventional, you get partial resolution with much less attention to complete resolution. And in this therapy, you have very few interventions by the listener once the process is going. In conventional therapy, you have back and forth exchanges going on between the therapist and the patient. And this, even in a large group of 16 to 20 people, half of the people clear a trauma. <laughs> In conventional therapy, a very small percentage of the patients work each group. In this one, you have emotional, restful music is played. That's in the instructions. You want to play beautiful music in the background. Uh, Michael loved to play Inya. And in traditional therapy, there's typically no music. In this therapy, the average sudge entering the group is four to eight. The average sudge leaving the group is one to three. Typically, every patient lowers their suds, very few nightmares after clearing. In conventional therapy, unknown suds, they're not measured. You don't know where people are, really. And in PTSD groups, typically either average group suds increases or the patients numb out with subsequent nightmares. And the last but not the least, in this uh, therapy, the patients are seen as healing themselves. They're healing their own self. And in traditional psychotherapy, the therapist gets the credit. So this is, um, this is self-empowering all the way across the board. This is taking it out to the woods. It's taking it down to Backo Road, where people don't have the money or the training, or even know that such a thing as a therapist even exists. It's going down to Hurricane Katrina and quickly training a bunch of Red Cross volunteers how to facilitate so everybody there can go ahead and clear it. That's what this is. This is a self-empowerment technology that all of you can learn and master. Believe me. I'm going to look at you for a cue, what to do next. And you can't let them off the hook at this point. You want to get more feeling words. So you read back the three or four that they just gave you and you say, 
Go within and see what other feelings you have. Now, the next sentence says, don't interrupt their silences. And the next sentence says, these silent times are when the most important inner work is being done. You keep doing this, reading back what they've already said, asking them what else they're feeling, and letting them be silent and go within and check. And you do this till you have about 20 words, typically. And you may have to dig a little bit to get that. But at this point, they're beginning to go into a mild trance. They're beginning to leave their attention of the outer world, and they're going within, and they're feeling these feelings. And their inner silences are pure gold. And I'm talking 24 karat. You don't interrupt them when they have that far away look in their eyes or their eyes are closed and they're doing deep inner work. When you are supposed to do something, they will look at you for a cue. They will be stuck. They will have reached a point where they look at you for a prompting. Now at that point, suppose you've got 15 feeling words. You just read it back to them. You read back the 15 words and you might just say to them, okay, I've got angry, disillusioned, let down, betrayed, upset, um, hopeless, uh, confused, um, powerless, um, you know, along that line. And you can say, well, could it be that you also feel and you might say something and they'll say, oh no or oh yes. But anyway, try to fluff it out to about 20 words. For some reason, after doing, you know, literally hundreds of these things, if you take enough time with this section, if you take enough time and don't hurry them, you can get about 20 words. I mean, give or take. Now, this list of 20 words are the feelings that are going to have to change for this trauma to be healed. Now, in the case of the war veterans, the trauma was pretty obvious. It didn't take us long to figure out which trauma it was that we needed to be cleared. If you're dealing with the civilians, this one can be kind of tricky. Um, so what you do, because the next stage after getting your feeling word list, is to figure out which what has been triggered in their past that's up now on a subconscious level? So this is probably the hardest part right here, okay? You read the list back to them, and you explain. You say, this is a constellation of feelings, just like you have a constellation of stars. When have you felt this particular group of feelings before? And they will go in, and they'll come up with typically something about five of these things. They'll, the first one will be like, well, I felt this way <clears throat> in 1984 when my, I'm just all making this up, when my first husband left, she, I, I found out he was having an affair with my best friend, and um, I felt this way then. I wanted to commit suicide. At first I was very angry and wanted to kill him, and then I wanted to commit suicide. And you say, okay, thank you for sharing. When have you felt this way before? And you can read the constellation again, and they think a little bit, and they'll come up with something like, well, I felt this way uh, at the end of my high school. Uh, on graduation night when I found my boyfriend in bed with my best girlfriend. We had been going steady for three years. And we were planning on getting married. And yeah, we had all been drinking a little bit. I'm making this up, by the way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, you know, I was kind of out of it and I was trying to find him and I knew I had to get home for curfew. And I went out to the car, and guess what? They were in the back seat doing it. 
And it was not only the betrayal of my boyfriend, but my best girlfriend. Now they're really getting deep. So you say, okay, that's good. Now, when have you felt this way before? And typically they'll think for a little while and they'll say, I felt this way when I was nine years old and my father came home drunk one night and announced he was leaving us. And I looked at my father and I said, Daddy, does that mean you don't love us anymore? And he turned around and said, yes, it does. And he went out the door and slammed it. And he left us. And I have never been able to trust a man again after that. Well, that's pretty intense, and you're probably suspecting that maybe this is the one you need to clear. But ask him again. When have you felt this way before? And they go deep within, and they think. And they go really, really deep. And they might come back and say, I was pretty happy up to that point. You know, we were a happy family, but when my father left that night, I think this is the one. And so just to make sure, and there's handouts on this, I hope they're in there. Okay, they're in there on this very process, how to find the infected wound is what it's called. Just to be sure, you just go back through one, two, three, four, five, however many they are, and you say, if you had a magic wand and could cure...